It is good to see all of this energy in the room. Very good to see this energy around our Center for Global Africa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Professor Leandra Casson Marshall. I am the Outreach Director and uh, Research Analyst for the University Center for Economic Development and International Trade. Also, I'm an adjunct professor um, in history, political science, and philosophy department, as well as in global societies. And I am tasked at being your moderator for this particular panel. Uh, our topic is development opportunities for U.S. businesses with APRM member countries. Our panel members, me members are the following. Minister Defala, APRM Chair of Focal Points. Dusty Baker, baseball legend. And businessman, Cool Baker Global. Dean Michael Casson, DSU College of Business. Ms. Zemini Laku, um, Special AP APRM Advisor. And our response will be given by Ms. Tumi Delamini. And, and, and forgive me if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. And of course, we want to invite you to come and sit with the panel. We will first have in introductory remarks by each of our panelists on this topic. Uh, merci, uh, professeur. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, je voudrais simplement me présenter en plus de mes fonctions de ministre. I would like to introduce myself in addition to my functions as minister. Uh, je suis enseignant depuis 54 ans. I've been a teacher for 54 years. Donc, j'ai monté toutes les échelles de l'école primaire en Brousse jusqu'à l'université. J'ai occupé toutes sortes de fonctions de direction, de postes de membres du gouvernement et de conseiller du président de la République. And I've had all uh, types of posts from the bottom of government levels to the higher government levels, including ah, je, minister. Voilà, je voudrais simplement dire que lors de la session tenue le 20, du 21 au 26 août 2016, I would just like to say that in the session that was held from the 21st to the 26th of August, le, 2016, uh, Nairobi, in Nairobi, le chef d'État avait adopté l'étude de 12 goulots d'étranglement présenté par le président de l'Ouganda, M. Yoweri. Um, the, there were 12 obstacles outlined during this conference by His Excellency Mr. Yoweri Museveni uh, Kaguba. President of the Republic of Uganda. Et il y a 12, je vais pas vous les citer. There, there are 12, I will not give them all. Mais simplement deux ou trois, la, par exemple, la désorientation idéologique. I will give you two or three, uh, starting with uh, ideological disorientation. La faiblesse des États. Weakness of national government bodies. La petitesse des marchés. Uh, the small markets. Le sous-développement des ressources humaines. Underdeveloped human resources. Le sous-développement de l'agriculture. Under underdeveloped agriculture. Le sous-développement du secteur de service. And underdeveloped service sectors. Etc. 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 Et lorsque nous Africains nous nous rencontrons. And when we as Africans meet. Avec notre diaspora afro-américaine. With uh, members of the African American diaspora. Je voudrais simplement vous attirer uh, un fait. Tout à l'heure, j'ai demandé à Madame l'ambassadeur, il y a quel est le nombre de la population afro-américaine? Uh, Elle m'a dit 50 millions. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to find out something, and I was told that there were 54 million African Americans. Un million 
diaspora africaine. And, and, and 1 million from the uh, African diaspora. Donc, uh, donc 41 millions d'Afro-Américains et 9 millions d'Africains, ça fait 50 millions. C'est l'équivalent des six États de la CEMAC. Le Tchad, le Cameroun, la République centrafricaine, le Congo, le Gabon et la Guinée. And um, the total of Africans and African-Americans African comes out to the population of six countries, including Chad, Congo, and Gabon, among others. Donc, de ces difficultés, les chefs d'État les ont étudiées, ils ont pris des décisions et ils ont confié la poursuite de l'action au secrétariat continental du MAEP. Uh, so the African leaders and heads of state studied these problems and they gave a met charge to the APRM Continental Secretariat to come up with an analytical report. Alors, la question qui nous est posée, the question that we were asked was, quelles sont les opportunités what are the opportunities lorsqu'il s'agit de nous, Afrique, avec l'Amérique à travers sa diaspora ou simplement l'Amérique à travers ses institutions. Yes, what are our possibilities for opportunity between Africans and Africa, African Americans and Africans and other members of the African diaspora? La première des choses, moi je pense que c'est l'approche culturelle. The first thing I would say is the cultural approach. Parce que Lorsque moi, Tchadien, je parle à mon frère Dusty, afro-américain. When I speak to my brother uh, Dusty, an African-American. Immédiatement, nous, nous nous comprenons. Même s'il parle anglais, je parle arabe ou français. Nous nous comprenons parce que nous venons de la même racine. Yes, even though he speaks French and I speak English, we understand each other because we have the same roots. Nous partageons la même identité culturelle. Et je suis très fier de dire de ce que j'ai vu que les Afro-Américains n'ont pas perdu leur identité parce que quand on, on la retrouve à travers le sport, à travers la culture, à travers euh, les différents faits de la communauté Afro-Américaine ici aux États-Unis. Et je suis très heureux de dire que les Afro-Américains que j'ai rencontrés Uh, Mais, we share the same identity, and through, be it through sports, culture, or various encounters of donc, this nature. La première clé, the first key, pour aborder l'Afrique, c'est la culture. To, to dealing with Africa is culture. La première, deuxième clé, the second key would be, c'est l'échange entre les membres de nos deux communautés would be exchanges between our two communities. Quand jeune, uh, dans les 61, When I was young in the, in the 70s, we received the first cohort of the Peace Corps uh, et, in Africa. Il n'y avait pas de Noirs et ça nous a révolté. On avait demandé à ce que si il y a des corps de paix qui viennent au Tchad, il faut qu'il y ait un membre de la communauté afro-américaine. Ça a été fait. We were shocked because uh, there were no members of the Peace Corps in the 60s. Excuse me, I corrected myself. In the 60s, Et because there were no African Americans. We wanted African Americans to be part of the Peace Corps. Je donne un simple exemple. Moi, j'étais euh, jeune euh, en train de, pour devenir instituteur. I was young studying to be a teacher. Et c'est un jeune afro-américain de Michigan, William. A young qui a African introduit American. le basket en tant que sport national chez les filles. And he uh, it started basketball as a national sport for women. Et comme ça a été accepté rapidement, la télé, les, 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 les objets électroniques qui viennent des États-Unis, la musique, l'athlétisme, on se mesure aux images de noirs américains. And because of um, the communications devices such as television, radio, we were able to compare ourselves to what was going on in America. Cependant, il faut se dire la vérité, vous, vous êtes Américains. Nonetheless, we must tell the truth, because you are Americans. 
quand la Chine vient investir des milliards, When elle the, ne pose pas de questions en disant voilà les conditions. When the Chinese come to invest billions of dollars, they do not pose conditions on this money. Ils viennent et disent bon qu'est-ce que vous avez dit non on a le pétrole. Ok, 10 milliards je suis prêt. Ok, uh, what do you have for example we have uh, oil. Ok, here are 10 billion dollars for oil. Mais quand c'est le gouvernement des États-Unis vient, les, les investisseurs viennent et disent quel est le, votre état législatif en termes de tel droit, en termes de tel droit, alors qu'on a le loi sur le pétrole et machin, ils passent dans des conditions politiques de okay. gouvernance. When Americans come, they ask us about our government system and how we run things, and so they put si vous vous politics. Political vous conditions on dealing with Africa. Vous êtes dans un où tout est urgent. If you are a member of an African government where everything is an emergency. exporter. Et ici, il y a les conditions. Il y a tel article, ça. Il y a tel, nya, 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 il y a tel. Vous choisissez qui. Moi. Je choisis celui qui me donne 10 milliards tout de suite. Parce que demain, c'est les emplois, demain, c'est les fiscalités, c'est l'argent qui rentre dans le trésor pour faire le développement. So, if you had the choice between 10 billion dollars just given outright or aid given with conditions, which would you choose? I would take the 10 billion dollars because there we can build schools and develop our country. Alors, je pense que ici le rôle de la communauté afro-américaine est très important. I think that the role of the African American community is very important. Parce que vous êtes nos frères, vous nous parlez le langage de la vérité. Because you are my brothers and sisters, you speak the language of truth. Pour nous dire non, ça c'est ici frère, ça ne marche pas. On fait ça comme ça, on fait ça comme ça. Vous nous aidez à nous élever en termes juridiques, en termes de droit, en termes de développement. So you can be helpful in explaining your laws to us. So you can tell us, no, it's not done this way here, so that we can get through the um, bureaucratic uh, red tape much more easily. Et notre jeunesse est prête à vous écouter. And our young people are ready to listen to you. Donc, la, la première des choses, c'est de nous amener dans votre contact, parce que vous avez l'expérience et la compétence, c'est d'avoir les données. The first thing that you have to do, since you have the contact, is to give us data, information. Et ici, nous avons, par exemple, euh, discuté avec le professeur Ezra sur la possibilité de venir au Tchad, de nous aider à dresser la carte minière du Tchad. Oh, so we've asked uh, with the professor Ezra to come to Tchad to help us Establish what is what are the, what is the current level of the industry mining industry in China. Ça veut dire que l'université de Delaware, les juristes vont nous aider à faire des lois pour que le Tchad, à travers ses ressources, les exploite en ayant des, une convention qui qui permet aux Tchadiens de gagner quelque chose. In other words, Delaware State could send uh, experts to help us write the laws that would be beneficial for us so that we could benefit from our own resources. Donc nous, on est, on est je dis uh, déjà Esra, dès que nous recevons l'offre, immédiatement nous allons décider d'inviter l'Université de Delaware de venir pour nous aider justement à uh, faire cette carte des richesses minières du Tchad. So, as I was saying to Ezra, as soon as you make us an offer, we will have you come to Chad and set up the mining, a mine mapping resource chart. Là, ça veut dire quoi? What does this mean? Ça veut dire que avec vous, nous allons bâtir ce que moi j'appelle le contrat de confiance. With you, uh, we will establish what I call the contract of confidence. Et nous, euh, nous sommes, en tout cas les Tchadiens, nous sommes le gardien du, de l'accord Maeb Université d'État de Delaware. And as Parce que c'est signé sur nous. Uh -huh. We have an agreement with Delaware State University that we have already signed. So the framework is in place. 
parce que nous avons depuis 2009 une vision africaine du régime minier de l'Afrique à l'horizon 2050. Et nous, nous, vous allez nous aider à, en fonction de cette vision à avoir la carte, les textes et peut-être éventuellement s'il y a parmi vous des entrepreneurs dans le domaine minier, nous sommes prêts à le recevoir. And since 2009, we have established the mining industry uh, set for the horizon 2050. And we would like for you to come and help us establish the laws and the uh, structure for this. Enfin, deuxième opportunité dans mon propre pays. A second opportunity in my own country. J'ai vu en venant ici votre climat, les températures dans le Tchachacha. I've seen the uh, weather here in this state. Sometimes it rains, sometimes it gets cold. We have uh, uh, much sun in Africa. You have experience with energy, uh, solar energy. You have the technology. You have the resources. We have the sun. Donc, <laughs> ensemble, essayons. So let's work together. Et donc, voilà ce que je tenais à vous dire. That's what I wanted to Mais say to you. Mais j'insiste. But I insist on this following point. Sur le fait de la culture. I insist on the um, existence of culture. Dans les années, quand j'étais jeune, je n'avais pas perdu ses cheveux. When I was young, I still had hair then. Uh, donc, j'ai dansé avec uh, la musique de Cool. I danced to the music of Cool. Et tout à l'heure, il y a le Commodore qui était là. And j'étais pas sportif, mais quand même, j'étais bon would... danseur. Mais t- hier, je l'ai trouvé vraiment avec plaisir. Ça m'a rappelé. Um, I was not an athlete, but I was a good dancer, so I was very happy la to meet him yesterday. La culture, c'est le fondement de la base de ce que nous voulons construire ensemble, chers frères et sœurs. Uh, the culture is the basis of what we are trying to establish, my brothers and sisters. Nous vous attendons. We are waiting for you. Et je dirais, vive la sixième région de notre continent africain. Long live the sixth region. Là, je ne peux pas être Africa. plus éloquent que l'ambassadeur. Merci. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Dusty Baker, uh, former baseball player and manager for almost 50 years. Uh, I come from a very proud uh, African-American family whose mother and father were in charge of the NAACP in my town, Riverside, California. And I was in the junior NAACP, which I didn't really realize the importance and magnitude of that when I was a kid. Um, And then my mom went back to school, uh, taught African studies uh, in Sacramento, California. Uh, She was in school the same time. Well, I signed out of high school. I didn't really want to sign. I wanted to go to college and play basketball. Uh, But, you know, through prayer, I was told and and directed to play baseball. And um, I went right to the South in 1967 to Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, Much to my surprise, it was totally uh, different than where I came from, but it was much the same. Um, some of the surprises that, that um, you know, I endured at that time, uh, you know, I shouldn't have been surprised. Uh, then I sent my sister to South America to be a, um, uh, a missionary at an African village in, in Colombia, uh, in Palenque. And uh, again, you know, just all added to, uh, you know, to to the pride that I was given by my mom and my dad, and I'm trying to pass it on to my, my kids and pass it on to the young people that are out there uh, you know, today. Uh, life hasn't been easy, uh, but it was a wonderful journey and a wonderful life. And uh, every time I would get fired from a job, um, I, I'd try to be like my dad and think about what my dad would do and start a new venture. And uh, my first venture, the first year I was fired, um, and we had just won a division, 
And so as an African-American, I was always told by my mom and dad that you have to be twice as good to accomplish the same thing that you know, uh, the, you know, the white Americans would. And, and I learned that you had to be three times good because no matter what I tried to do, no matter how good I did, there was always something lacking. And so I turned my energies to, I was a, I was a grape grower. I still am a grape grower. Uh, very few African-Americans in the wine business. I don't drink a lot of wine, but I, I make wine. And uh, then the next time I was fired, that's when I uh, started a, a, a Baker Energy team. Uh, my first venture is Baker Family Wine, then I started Baker Energy team, and then I, got a, I um, fully solarized my house. Uh, I have a solar well, solar pump, solar ground mount, uh, a roof mount, uh, carport, uh, you know, instant hot water. I was trying to figure out a way to leave a, a better carbon footprint for my kids and their kids' kids. And um, so I went, to a, um, I went to a conference, and the conference was called the Roth Conference, and they take people public, and they're in the energy business, and uh, uh, there were about five African Americans there out of 5,000 people, and very few women. And then I realized, hey, man, uh, this has been the same thing as most of my life, that this industry needs me, and I need the industry, and hopefully I can pass on to others what was given uh, you know, to me. Uh, again, I got out of, the, out of the game. I was forced out of the game. Then I got a call from, um, from uh, Cool. And I had never met Cool before. And so uh, this brother says, hey, man, this is Cool. I said, I'm Cool, too. So who is it? <laughs> and, so, and so he says, uh, yeah, man, Ken Griffey Sr. is my cousin. And he says that you have an energy team. I mean, an energy company. And I said, yeah, I got an energy company. So I says, I still don't know this is cool. So I said, man, you got to hit a tune or something and let me know that this is really cool. I forget what he starts singing on the phone. And I said, okay, man, this is cool. And so, and, and so uh, you know, we talked about things. He told me he had been to Africa a number of times. I had been to Africa uh, once with, with uh, Dr. Uh, Azra Aharon, and that's how I, I first went to Africa, even though my mother's been to Africa probably 25 times, probably. And uh, that was my first uh, trip there. Uh, uh, Azra said, Dusty, uh, you know, we want to get you involved. Uh, cool and I talked. Um, so we formed uh, first, um, you know, my daughter does all my logos for, you know, my different companies. Uh, and so she, she said, Dad, what do you want? I says, well, I'd like some African colors in my, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, in my logo. She says, uh, well, what's it going to be called? And I said, well, Cool wants to call it Baker Cool. But see, I've been called Cool Baker all my life. So <laughs> that's why we changed it to Cool Baker. But, uh, and it's called Cool Baker Global. And, uh, you know, we do, you know, we, we do need some help. Because, uh, um, you know, economically, I mean, this is a heck of a venture. Uh, you know, we don't have the money that Shell has or Standard Oil or whoever it has this, you know, um, exploiting uh, Africa. But, you know, we're going to get it done. And uh, we're going to get it done whether it's uh, uh, LED lights or solar uh, um, uh, street lights. Uh, we realize that, uh, you know, the economy needs it. We realize that the water system needs it. Uh, uh, the kids are are getting further and further behind in the technology world, and you, and you can't have technology without electricity. So I just want to say thank you. It's a tremendous honor to be here uh, today. Um, my mom, I'm still, you know, her little dusty, and so her, my, my mom's going to be extremely proud to know that I'm affiliated with you, and uh, thanks for having me. Thank you. Well, well, Dusty, I think I may be in the same shoes because my mother, who is extremely proud of me as well, and um, she is actually sitting in the audience, and I'm still her little Mikey. Hey, hey. So, uh, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so, and, and it is interesting because I, I heard the minister here from Chad, my colleague on the panel, state that when he was younger, he had hair, and then I looked at the panelists and I said, I must be the oldest panelist up here. 
I'm the only brother without hair. So hello everyone, my name is Michael Casson, and I am the Dean of the College of Business here. But interestingly enough, I'm actually from Dover, Delaware, and that is interestingly enough because many people are surprised when they hear that. Um, one of the things when I went away to uh, college, when I finished my graduate work, I said that I wanted to come back to Dover, come back to my community, come back home, um, to begin to figure out ways to best empower my community. And so in thinking about that homecoming, that, that mindset that I had, and now sitting on this panel, I, I'm thinking to myself that I haven't quite made it home yet in terms of the potential impact that could happen from whatever expertise that I was able to garner while in school and thinking about my next step, my next journey home, as our, as our colleague said earlier today, starts that thousand mile step journey starts with the first step. So one of my first steps was Dover and, and surely my next step is, is Africa as well. So I'm excited about this opportunity. So from, from the College of Business perspective, again, I, I serve as the dean. However, prior to that and still to date, I serve as the director for our University Center for Economic Development and International Trade. Again, the function of that center or the charge of that center is to leverage the resources and talents of Delaware State University. Now, this is as written to support the economic development initiatives throughout the state of Delaware and the Mid-Atlantic region. Uh, however, as we think about the purpose of this panel and we think about how not only the community that I wanted to come back to, how, how we can impact that community, but think about the purpose again of this panel, which is how do we engage our brothers and sisters in Africa through business opportunities, then it all seems to work together. Because as we think about leveraging the businesses, both in the talent, both within Delaware State University and our community, the opportunities for enterprise growth and development within Africa are great, right? Well, again, the leading economies are in Africa. So we have to think about this in terms of how do we best leverage our resources. I think the other important thing that I must mention here as well is that as African Americans here, we have to think about how do we best or collectively pull our resources together? Because that's the only way we're gonna have the true impact. We all understand the opportunities that are happening in Africa, but I would like to think about this as a, as a, as a two-way exchange. Uh, we all know the, the talent that exists in Africa. We all know the resources that are there as well. And when you combine those talent and resources there with the opportunities that exist um, in both areas, both here in the States and in Africa, if we could figure out again how to collectively uh, leverage our resources and work together, then the impact would be that much greater. So it's a charge for us to begin to partner with each other. Think about how we best leverage each other's talent, both here and abroad. Think about our African-American-owned banks that are suffering right now because, uh, quite frankly, we're not patronizing. Our dollars are not going to these communities to these banks. Our dollars are not going to African-American communities right here in the States. So again, these are lessons that could be learned on both, on both sides. We can, we can surely learn lessons from, uh, again, our, our expertise that are coming from Africa, but surely we can think about ourselves at home, how we best and effectively bring our resources together to, again, have the greatest impact. So I thank you all. Hello everyone. My name is Zamanai Lako. I am originally from Ethiopia. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. I went to school undergraduate uh, and graduate school here in the US. I came when I was 19. Uh, and and some, something that reinforces the, the effect of the demonization of Africa. Uh, there is an incident when I was a fresh fresh man, fresh woman, <laughs> in college, uh, a young uh, white boy came to me and he said, Zemanai, oh, you are from Africa. He said, yes, I am. Uh, do you live in a tree? I said, yes, I do. I was quite arrogant when I told him that. 
Yes, I live on a tree. Do you have pet animals? Yes, I have an elephant. <laughs> this boy was tall and broad. <laughs> so I told him, and, and he said, what do you call him? I call him Bob. That was his name. <laughs> the kid didn't think twice. He ran across the hall, and he announced to everyone that I live on a tree, and I have an elephant pet. <laughs> his name is Bob. All my African friends laughed at him. The others didn't get it. So this is just a very simple example to say the kind of imagery uh, that has been created about Africa and Africans. And, and that this, this systematic demonization is continuing to this day. Uh, and it's going to take us quite a long time and a very, very serious effort to battle with this every day. Uh, a, a very recent example is, uh, you all have heard in the news, the, uh, the doomed Ethiopian Airlines flight, um, where quite a number of people from all over the world uh, perished. The audacity of New York Times and Washington Post to attribute blame to the incompetency of the pilots. First, they blamed it to the Ethiopian Airlines. Second, they blamed the pilots. The pilots were highly educated. It has one of the best schools in Ethiopia. It's not only for Ethiopia, for the region. And, and that airline has been functioning for more than 70 years. And by the way, thanks to uh, uh, black American uh, brothers who helped to set up that airline after the model of the TWA. Uh, but it has, it has kept it. So what I wanted to say is the Ethiopian Airlines CEO uh, stood out and he said that uh, New York Times, Washington Post have absolutely no basis to, to, to defame. And I heard they might be even uh, fighting a lawsuit against the defamation. And this is something that we cannot let go because they want to perpetuate that Africans are incompetent, they don't know what they are doing, and this and the other. Um, and so this battle, I mean, this working together, both among black Americans, African Americans here, and the African American community in Africa, will not be very easy. We should not have any illusion about it. It's going to require a lot of commitment, a lot of hard work. That's what I learned through the decades of my work with the United Nations. I worked in the United Nations system for many years, where we were developing uh, development decades for Africa. But in 2000, uh, President Mbeki and President uh, Awad of Senegal decided to change the narrative of Africa. And they decided that they were going to come up with an African development plan, uh, which is called the New Partnership for Africa's Development, um, uh, of which the, also the APRM emerged, the African Peer Review Mechanism. That development plan has a, a very um, uh, rigorously developed uh, sectoral plans. There is infrastructure, there is water, there is electricity, dams, uh, there is education, health, agriculture. And, and I want to uh, refer back to what the, our CEO uh, mentioned earlier, that the past cooperation between Africa and Ethiopia has been very sporadic and individualized. I think the institutionalization of this relationship is ab absolutely detrimental for the success. And what we mean in terms of opportunities for development, yes, there are opportunities. But I think if these opportunities, if the business community here links with the business community in Africa collectively, and NEPAD has two uh, very important groups. One is the NEPAD Business Group, and, and the other one is uh, the African Business Roundtable. These are organized businesses who focus on opportunities within Africa. Uh, and I think also for, the, for any project to be successful, uh, because it's not a straight line to function in Africa, uh, countries are still working through like the APRM, through improving corporate governance, rules and procedures. It will be very difficult to navigate for an outsider. So it's important to partner 
with local business people who know the terrain. Uh, and, and, and I think this uh, important initiative, the partnership with uh, DSCU, uh, opens up uh, this institutionalized relationship and avenue for both the Africans to learn so much from here and for, uh, uh, for uh, like Americans, African Americans, to be able to invest. Uh, and I think the most important uh, component out of this is also knowledge is power. Uh, know the terrain, know the place. Uh, APRM uh, produces excellent reports, and those reports can actually give you uh, a lot of information, a lot of information about what is going on uh, in that country. Uh, I would say that I look forward to interacting with any one of you if you have any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Leandra. Uh, my name is Tumi Lamini, and I'm with the APRM. So I've been asked to give a response, which I thought would come at the end, but I think now is a good time as any to actually give my own uh, perspective on this subject. And because I represent APRM, which is part of the African Union, I think what I would like to do is to give you just a very brief overview of the economic landscape on the continent currently. And with that overview, I think business people will then be able to say to themselves or ask themselves the question where and how do they fit in within this um, current landscape. Um, you may very well know that six out of the 10 fastest growing economies on, in the world currently are in Africa and Ethiopia Rwanda and Ghana lead the pack out of those six. So what, what is that beginning to tell us about this continent of Africa, which the panel earlier on said, we need to start changing the narrative about what Africa is. The second issue that I want to raise around the economic landscape on the continent is that two weeks ago, um, the, economic, um, the African Union had been working for a, period, for a number of years, actually, on ratifying what we call the AFCFTA, AFCFTA, which is the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Now, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement is an agreement of all of the African countries, 55 of them on the continent, which is intended to ease the movement of goods, the movement of people, the movement of services, which ultimately is really intended to benefit businesses that operate on the continent and to open all of our borders on the continent for ease of doing business. Africa is known for having what we call very thick borders. And that means that it's very difficult for countries or for um, companies that do not belong into those 55 states to operate in other states. Now, obviously this has not benefited Africa for a, the longest period of time. And in fact, if you look at the statistics around the world, um, we are a continent that is the least um, integrated e economically. If you look at um, Europe, Europe leads the, the world in terms of the, the continent that is the most integrated. Um, trade in Europe is at around, amongst the countries, is at around 70%. In Asia, it's standing at around 50%. And in Africa, we're just getting into the, 20, uh, into the 20s. So this CFTA is intended for all of the African countries to begin to trade with one another. And my question to you, and I know this may be quite wild at the moment, is if the sixth region is, as the African heads of state have said, um, the sixth region of the African um, Union, what role, therefore, can the sixth region play and what benefit can come to the sixth region and therefore the businesses of the sixth region to take part and benefit from this integration of the African Union and from the regional, from the increased regional intra-Africa trade? Now, you know, I'm not an academic, but there is a new center for, um, um, center for Africa Global Issues on, on, this, um, 
on this campus. And I would like to say perhaps one of the first issues that you can look at is in order to improve um, business integration, not only for African businesses within Africa, but how, what role can African American businesses play and how can they benefit from this new CFTA, even though you are not a sovereign state. And of course, we know that all 55 member states are sovereign states, but the sixth region is not. So maybe you could look at that as a question. And if you can find the answer, and the answer is there, then that does not only make it easier for African American and diaspora businesses to begin to participate in the economic activities of the continent, but it actually puts together a platform puts a platform where you can not only participate, but actually thrive, and actually also begin to actualize some of those um, initiatives that we are talking about around how we can exchange um, academic information, how we can exchange scholarship between um, the diaspora as well as um, the African Union. Um, the other point that I would like to raise on this is, you know, milestones tend to provide us with very significant opportunities. So whether it's a birthday or whatever milestone we're reaching, and those milestones tend to give us an opportunity to also pause and say to ourselves, how have we been doing? And this being the 400th year of the Africa, of the 400th anniversary of the transatlantic slave trade, I would like to say that Let's also use this year, 2019, to also not only define the manner in which the narrative has been conducted around who and what Africa is, but let us also use the platform and the milestone of this year to say, going forward as Africans, how do we collectively begin to also work together? I think I've heard from Michael Kassin and, and also Zemenai next to me talking about the importance of acting collectively. You know, in, in my past life, in the job before this one, I worked for a trade association. And I came across and used to work with business groups from this country, such as the American Chamber of Commerce, the Corporate Council on Africa. And not once did I come across, at that level, did I come across a pan-African business corporate, um, chamber of commerce or a business grouping that represented the diaspora seeking to work on the continent. And that to me, even though at the time, because you know I was working in the American Chamber of Commerce, it, it bothered me quite a lot. But within the context of this particular conversation, I think the question that we need to ask ourselves, and most especially the African diaspora in the Americas is, why are we not working together? And perhaps this year, on the, whilst we celebrate and commemorate the anniversary, then this is the year that we begin to form these alliances. And the African peer review mechanism is in place to assist you and to actually assist you to navigate, the, you know, to navigate all of the landscapes within Africa if we can come together and have a collective approach to how you work um, on the continent. Thank you. In the interest of time, we do have, um, we have, we're a little bit over time, but I still say that we can have at least two to three questions. Um, that is one of the reasons why I wanted you to give your response, because I knew that she would uh, prompt us to really think about um, you know the, initi the initiatives and the and and really get our mind really thinking about those ways that we can come together that we can connect. Um, and when she said um, at the end a Pan African Chamber of Commerce, that is something that we need to think about. And so I want to give I don't want to take the time myself. So if there are uh, persons who would like to ask them questions, um, we will just have you to come and you can use this ask your question and then we'll have another person to come and ask the question and then what I would like for you guys to do is um, when you hear you know a question that you would like to particularly answer then you feel free to do just that thank you um, I have a couple questions I think there will be quick questions one is there a united uh, is there a plan for united currency 
in Africa, one. Secondly, wanted to know, because of business, doing, trying to do business in Africa, especially with communications, is an issue due to the internet infrastructure in countries like Uganda. Question, is there a plan for infrastructure as far as communication, as far as internet, and allowing the people to be able to have unlimited data in Africa? Uh, that's a very important question, uh, especially when we're talking about doing business in Africa uh, on different levels. Um, and then my last question is, is it possible for me to get the information of the elder from, I believe Chad, if I'm not mistaken, from Chad, uh, um, just wanted to get his information and be able to contact him, uh, dealing with the discussion on law. Thank you very much. Thank you, my dear brother. We are in, in the process of carrying out the operations. Over the General Secretariat of the ARP. As soon as this body meets, Sur tout problème d'ordre juridique, de problème de contact, de problème quel type, dans quelle région nous devons aller, quel type de carte que nous devons euh, réaliser, parce que moi-même, je suis géomorphologue. Uh, Donc euh, voilà, nous sommes sous l'autorité du secrétariat général et nous allons réagir dès que nous recevons une lettre. Uh, du Secretariat Continental. Okay, so when the uh, Secretariat convenes, it will meet, deal with all sorts of problems, dealing with mind mapping and uh, also uh, legal uh, jurisdiction problems. And as soon as this convenes, we will be able to proceed in the manner that you indicated. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, make a couple of comments regarding the um, United Currency. There have been attempts uh, particularly in the southern region that within the preferential trade area, PTA, uh, and the Comesa region to have uh, they have tried it, but it has not uh, taken off. Uh, but it is, it is in the plan. Uh, it would probably take a few years, but it will come through. Uh, and in terms of communication, one of the major projects, which the NEPAD framework that I mentioned earlier, is to have a fiber optic uh, infrastructure all over Africa. That is in the process already. It has been started. I don't quite know exactly what stage it is, but it's there. Okay, thanks. And then also, just in addition to what Zemina has spoken about, um, with regards to infrastructure, data accessibility, roads, um, and so on, you know, we, there is an agency of the African Union called NEPAD, which is currently in the process of changing its name to the AU Development Agency. And that is the agency that is responsible for uh, putting in place infrastructure projects on, on the continent. And they, they have been working, actually, there have been quite a few projects that have been successful, such as the North and South Corridor Project, which is currently underway, and Rail Connection Services, from the east to the west, which are, um, are currently being worked on. So we recognize as the continent um, our limits in terms of some of the infrastructure that is necessary in order to attract the necessary foreign direct investment. And, and so that's why we have put in place agencies such as the NEPAD. And the integration of, of the continent, now speaking back to the first question around the currency, we recognize as well that you know, part of integration, that's going to be a process that is going to take many years. You know, Kwame Nkrumah's dream was a united Africa. And we are still sitting in 2019 
building the steps towards that united Africa. And I think it's important for us, for us to look at this dream and say and recognize that it's not going to take one generation or two generations. And we have a, a long-term view of the dream and how we are going to achieve it. And that perhaps it will be our grandchildren's grandchildren that will achieve that dream. Um, similarly, with the United Currency, we are a continent of 55 member states. And yes, we all have our different currencies. You know, just last night I read the latest report of the African Development Bank on the Africa Economic Outlook for West Africa. And one of the major issues that is being argued in this report that was issued two days ago is this United Currency for the West Africa, um, ECOWAS. And so the conversation is that we recognize that ECOWAS may not yet be ready for this United Currency. But we also recognize that that is where we need to be moving towards. And as soon as, because we have identified the risk and the, and the stumbling blocks towards the achievement of that united currency, I think we are well on track towards um, achieving the dream itself. Can I just add one more thing? Um, we should not have a very rosy picture. It's a work in progress. Uh, and you, as a business person, you cannot assume that you're going to go to country X and, and it's going to be smooth sailing. So when you are committed, you are committed to work with the problem, to try to solve it and to go along and grow together. So I would like to add to that as well. I think in the College of Business, we have a saying that we're students of problems, not disciplines. So effectively, what that means is that while your resident expertise or talent uh, may be necessary, it's not sufficient to find the solutions to that problem and or challenge. So we must collaborate, we must go across disciplines in order to find this. And so when I think about some of the um, kind of problems and or opportunities that you raised, I think about it from a supply chain perspective and I think about it as, oh, here's an opportunity to potentially grow a network. So I need MIS professionals, I need technology transfer professionals, but this is the business that you've already identified, right? So then how do I think about my other colleagues in other areas and, and, and cross, you know, cross those disciplines and find those solutions at that point of product need right now, which is network? And so that's how I think we should think about it. Thank you. Well, this will conclude our panel. And we want to just to, uh, thank everyone for your attention and thank the panelists for their information. Can you join me with a round of applause for them? Thank you so much. In five minutes, then we will transition to the next panel.